So we've probably heard a lot about the anatomy. I'm just going to quickly run over the anatomy and how to assess the tricuspid valve from an echocardiographic point of view, and then the main mechanisms and what might predict us to fail. So classically, we know it's supposed to be three leaflets. The annulus, like the mitral annulus, is not planar, it's saddle-shaped. And as uh, Tyrone David likes to remind me on a regular basis in the operating room, your tricuspid valve is as unique as your fingerprint. Everybody's got a different one. And the septal leaflet is the most consistent. Anterior and posterior, he suggests, might be just called one big long leaflet, which you call the free wall or the mural leaflet. In terms of the echo assessment, there's an excellent paper came out last month in the echo didactics portion of anesthesia and anesthesia. Going through the basic views, the four chambers sort of high up at the, level of the, at the level of the aortic valve. We're looking at the anterior and septal leaflets. And we push the probe in and retroflex a little bit, going down towards the four chamber and heading towards the coronary sinus. You see the septal and posterior leaflets. When we do our RV inflow outflow view, we see our posterior and septal leaflets again. Although if we anti-flex a little bit, we might get the anterior leaflets. Again, with the inter-individual variability, it's difficult to know exactly which leaflet you're looking at. We can then look at our modified bicaval view, and this will give us our anterior leaflet and then either our posterior or our septal leaflet. And finally, probably the best view to depict what you're looking at is your transgastric RV inflow view, and this gives us our posterior and anterior leaflets. So the causes of tricuspid regurgitation are, are multiple, um, and we're just going to concentrate on the functional TR due to annular dilatation and leaflet tethering. Now we know that the septum is fairly fixed, so the annulus must dilate laterally. The free wall dilates, and so the anterior and posterior leaflets will move further away. In fact, the latest updates from the uh, American Society and European Association of ECHO in 2010 have now decided your tricuspid annulus is allowed to be 42 millimeters and it's still normal. So they claim it's been, people seem to be getting bigger or the annulus seems to be getting bigger. And just a simple example of uh, annular dilatation. Now leaflet tethering. Which leaflet gets tethered? Well, Intuitively, you would think that it's the free wall that dilates, so it's the anterior or the posterior leaflet that's being dragged outwards as the right ventricle becomes more spherical. But interestingly, which goes against what we would think, it's the septal leaflet that gets tethered. And you often find that the jet is directed towards the interatrial septum because it's the septal leaflet that's pulled down. So that's one thing that, when I was reading a lot about this, that took me slightly by surprise. And it's due to the sphericity of the right ventricle is that actually the septum will bulge towards the left. So the septal leaflet is the one that gets tethered. Can we predict whether the, the repair is going to fail or succeed? There's been lots of things quoted about whether the annulus is over a certain size, the severity of the TL before you start, high pulmonary artery pressures, an LV ejection fraction less than 36%. I'm just going to concentrate on the leaflet tethering aspect. So you can see from this jet the, what would be either the anterior or the posterior leaflet is co-opting very low down from the, le from the plane of the annulus. And you can measure the tethering height. That's one measure we can use. And we do that on the mitral valve quite frequently. But in fact, there is evidence now with a tricuspid valve, you measure the tethering height. And you can also measure the tethering area, or tenting area, as it's sometimes called. And a lot of work done in the Cleveland Clinic in the States has shown that if you have a tethering height more than 8 millimeters, or a tethering area above 1.63 centimeters squared, very specific about the 6.3, shows reasonably good sensitivity and specificity for failure of repair if you just do an annular ring and don't do something to deal with the leaflet tethering problem. And they suggest that a tethering height more than 10 millimeters 
demands the fact that you don't just put a ring in, you do something about the leaflet tethering. Similarly, you can look at the angle that each leaflet makes with the plane of the tricuspid annulus. And when you get to more severe levels of TR, the angle of the, of the um, leaflets, particularly the septal leaflet, becomes greater. Now, you're supposed to measure this in mid-systole. And there is some evidence it was on univariate analysis, it was a, um, significant, but when they did it on multivariate analysis, it lost its significance that if the angle of the septal leaflet to the annular plane is more than 27 degrees, then this is a sign that an annular ring by itself will not cure the repair. You need to do something with the tethering. And now, of course, we've got 3D and 3D echoes taking over. Gives us nice pictures. Not sure, keeps the anaesthetist occupied for half an hour. You can actually now measure the tenting or tethering volume. So they do this in eight different planes to actually get a volume out of this. And they've shown, depending on how much volume is in that tethering zone, the degree of, of risk of having a failed repair just by doing an annular ring. So just to summarize, we all know the anatomy. We now know how to look at the tricuspid valve in various planes, the mechanisms of annular dilatation and tethering. But the predictors of failure, tethering height more than 8 millimetres, tethering area above 1.6, or a tethering volume. Thanks. <laughs>